All right, guys, my name is Vlad. I'm a real estate agent with the Purple Tree Group. Today, we're going to be covering a topic of selling the house by owner for sell by owner or FISBO. This is um, fairly popular with folks and uh, especially in the market is tough. People naturally want to try and save some money. And I want to give you 10 tips on how to best sell the house by owner in any environment, particularly in the tough market that we have right now. And I want you to stick around to the very end of the video because at the very end, I'm going to give you two additional bonus points that will help you with the process. So to start with, you need to consider the expenses, even though the allure of the sell by owner is that it's going to be free for you and you're going to get the cash paid for the property and then there's going to be no expenses. The reality it is not so. So um, let's refer back to um, a National Association of Realtors stats and talk about the number of buyers that work with realtors. It's approximately 97 to 98%. So the vast majority of buyers, as you see from this number, works with realtors and realtors will be expecting to get compensated if they bring the buyer through the property. If you say that you're not interested in paying the buyer's agent commission, most realtors will actually avoid showing your property to their clients like a plague. They will not go see the house and the sale will just simply not happen. So at the very least, you need to allocate the amount of money equal to roughly 2.5% of you in Canada or 3% in the US to make sure that you pay for the buyer's agent. On top of that, there are signs uh, that you need to potentially pay for if you want to increase exposure of the house and put something on the front lawn. There are professional photos that you need to take, possibly a video. We're going to talk about that a bit later in this video as well. There's also a lawyer's fees that you have to pay. And if you opt for advertising your property outside of the free channels, and there's a bunch of them, we're going to cover that as well, then you would need to be shelling out some money for pay per play platforms like Google and Facebook and Instagram, where you can promote the property as well. So the first consideration that you have to have is even though it's very promising that the house is going to sell without you incurring any expenses, there's going to be some expenses along the way and you have to consider those. The second thing is small repairs and decluttering of the property. So if you walk around the house that you're thinking about selling and you see that a lot of bulbs have burnt out, windows are half broken, shutters are not closing properly, door handles are falling apart, the toilet is leaking. So you need to fix all those things because if the buyers come and see that, they will focus on the small things and not only will they negotiate the price of the house on the basis of what they see, but subconsciously they will also be thinking, if I'm seeing so many little things that are not taken care of before the sale, what's going to be happening behind the walls and what don't I know about this property? So make sure that you fix all the little things first. And after you've done that, you need to attend to all the rooms and make sure that it's decluttered. So make sure that the beds are made, um, go through the kitchen, clean out the counter, make sure that everything is in the drawers, the same for uh, the bathroom. So if you have a lot of things on vanities, clean them up, put them in boxes. And a lot of people think, where do I put the boxes? Do I leave them where this stuff used to be? No, the most appropriate place for that would be the garage. And yes, it might look cluttered at the end of the day when people open up the garage door and they take a peek inside there's going to be a lot of stuff there but at the same time most people are used to using the garage as the storage facility so it's not going to be such a huge surprise and it's going to be away from the prying eyes it's going to be possibly under lock and key so not everybody is interested in giving access for people to look in their garages but if you do make it as tidy as possible put it in the garage and don't worry about it as long as the house house's interior rather is clean and welcoming to the buyers that are going through the property it will create a great impression. So those two things, small repairs, decluttering. Oh, one other, um, other important thing that I wanted to say, don't start running around if you feel that the kitchen is outdated, buying a new kitchen or worrying about replacing the tiles in the bathroom necessarily. Possibly a, a simple um, removing the caulking and putting in the new one if, if, if it looks black or it looks um, like there, there's mold somewhere will do the job. You don't have to replace the whole thing or spend tens of thousands of dollars and actually remodeling or renovating either kitchens or the bathrooms. You may not be able to get the money back, especially if the sale is within the next month or two and you're not looking at like two to three years down the road type future. Next thing is you got to figure out what your timeline for selling is and come up with the right price. So a lot of times people are thinking, well, you know what, my actual relocation has to happen in eight to 12 months and therefore can add a premium onto the property just to see how the market is performing. Maybe the market will go up in the interim and I'll get a higher price than if I were to ask whatever the market is carried or carries to bring me right now. So that's, that's a mistake because what a lot of times people don't realize is that it ties directly into the concept of days on market. And it, um, it makes sense to actually talk a little bit about that. So days on market is an indication of how long the house 
has been sitting on the market. And normally it's compared for the property in question for your house. So you go on the market and you've been on the market, say, for seven days. And if it's compared against the average days on market, which is usually kept by your board, and you can look up that information, and the average days on market will be somewhere, say, between 30 and 40 days. This is just sample numbers. You have to look up the numbers for your local board yourself. Once you pass that, pass that threshold of 30 to 40 days of being in the market without the sale, without the offers, the property becomes quote unquote damaged. So, you know, you can think about it as a ship at sea. So in the very first day, there is a breach in the hole and it's taken on water. And the longer it's staying at sea, the more water it takes on. And once it passes that threshold of the average days on the market, it can actually list or sink. And the same is true for your property. All of a sudden the property becomes, becomes damaged in, in, from the optics perspective and in the eyes of the buyers. You can think about it from this perspective as well. Imagine you're going and um, um, trying to find a house in the neighborhood that you're interested in. You fall upon a property that you absolutely fall in love with. You look at the days on the market, you look at your wife or your husband, you, you look at your agent and you're like, so what would the price be? And a house is originally listed at a million dollars. Most likely you'll get a recommendation to bring the price point on the offer as close to the asking price as possible because it's just been on the market for one day. You fell in love with the house. So, you know, you better give the sellers, un unless uh, there's some problems with the property that, that are absolutely obvious to you, you better give the sellers whatever price they're asking for the home or something very close to it. Now, and that seems like a reasonable, logical approach. Now, imagine that um, you going through that same neighborhood, you fall in love with the property, you look at the days on the market for that house, and all of a sudden it's on like 200 or 250. So it's been sitting on, on, on the market for like a better part of the year. You look at this thing and you think, okay, something is very wrong here. And definitely the property is overpriced. So you will be actually well advised and probably inclined yourself to bring in an offer, which is like 30 to 40% below market. So days on the market really plays a big role into this. And if you end up overpricing your house with the mindset that I don't have to move into a different location for like eight months, I might as well build in a 20 to 25% buffer on top of the market price for the property in anticipation of the market potentially going up in the hopes of selling it for more money. You might be in for a surprise that you pass that threshold of days on the market. Nobody's interested in your property anymore because it's been sitting there for like a hundred days. The house is not moving. And then that history is actually kept on the MLS as well. And we're going to talk about exposing the property on the MLS and the importance of this in a few minutes. And it's been sitting there forever. Nothing is going on. The property uh, history is kept. And then somebody is coming in. Even if you take the house off the market and you reprice it properly, right before you have to leave in eight months' time, people will be discounting the value of the house just because it was listed on the market within the same year or a few months into the prior year for a much higher price without selling. So something is wrong with the property, something is wrong with the sellers, something is, is, is wrong with the approach that the sellers have taken. So people will have all sorts of doubts when they're looking at the price point and looking at the house as well. So once you get your pricing right, it's time for you to start worrying about preparing the description for the property. And um, of course, if it's a cookie cutter house in an undescript neighborhood somewhere on the, on the outskirts of a big city, all the houses there might look the same and you have nothing better than to resort to the uh, trite descriptions like location, 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 or use superlatives like uh, the greatest backyard, the most fantastic swimming pool in the back, the largest uh, frontage of the property. You know, those things may or may not be true, but when potential buyers are reading through that sort of a description, the first thing that happens in their mind is that they're probably telling me tales. So things are not as good, the swimming pool is not the best, the frontage perhaps is not the largest, and the location is not as fantastic as they're trying to portray. So, you know, you, you can write whatever um, most pedestrian, simplistic description that you want, and then try and improve it, go to um, an online um, AI writing tool like ChatGPT, ask it to improve the description with the number of words that you want to use, depending on the platform where you're thinking about exposing that property and using that description. It will help you even with the most cookie cutter house, which most people will view as a commodity. It will actually present it in a more beautiful way than the house potentially appears in real life. So if the house is more unique than that, it has some unique features or you've added some um, incredible upgrades to the house. So you had a flood, for instance, and then following that, you decided to remedy all the issues, underpin the basement and waterproof it on the perimeter and install whipping tile and you've spent $25,000 for the whole process, it makes sense to make that story well pronounced 
in in your description as well so whenever buyers are looking at this they know that you've spent the money on maintaining the house properly if you installed a new furnace and the new ac unit two years back or you've um, changed your roof and it's a flat roof in particular you know you paid thirty five thousand dollars for that so make sure that people know about that and if there are any known issues in the house that will be absolutely evident to anybody looking at this or expect inspecting the property put them forward as well so you don't have any surprises when negotiating and we're going to touch on that point actually as well in a little bit closer towards the end of this video now it's time to start thinking about taking professional photos of the property, taking a video of the home and possibly a 3D tour as well. So a lot of times folks that are selling the house on their own think that um, pics that they can take on their iPhone will do. It could be underexposed, overexposed, it could be all crooked, the lighting could be completely off, the angles could be off, the um, exposure of each room that they're showing could be insufficient. They're only showing 20% of the room as opposed to trying to show, say, 70 from the angle that taking the photo from. It's better to hire somebody who knows what they're doing. So hire a professional, allocate um, that expense in your budget when you're thinking about the expenses. Remember point one, selling a house will actually cost you something. Photography is one of those things where it makes sense to spend the money. And it's not going to be expensive for most homes. The um, a price tag for pictures, video, possibly an overhead tour with a drone and a 3D tour will cost you five to six hundred dollars. You'll have those pictures as memories, you know, if nothing else, for a long, long time. But also, most importantly, those pictures will actually help you promote the house in the best possible light. And when the buyers are looking at those, they will be interested enough because this is the first point of entry for you. You put it up online, they see the photos. This is when they either get hooked or they continue scrolling onto the next property. So the better your photos are, the more chance you stand of buyers actually becoming interested in the property to go do in physical showing. And that starts the process. That starts the whole process when they see the house, they fall in love with the house, they submit an offer, you negotiate, and then ultimately you sell the property if everybody's happy with the price and the terms. So photos, video, a drone if necessary, and a 3D tour of the house as well. Um, a 3D tour of the house, on top of giving buyers the ability of going through every room in the property without leaving their couch, will also give you the uh, floor plans, which is very important. It's an option, it doesn't cost a lot, maybe a photographer will charge you 20 to 30 bucks extra on top of what you're already going to be paying, but it makes sense to have pictures um, of, of, or rather, a floor plan photos exposed on MLS or anywhere where you're planning to promote the property will allow buyers to actually uh, play with the furniture placement and see how the rooms flow without having to go and see the house necessarily. So, again, you avoid unnecessary, unnecessary visits unnecessary foot traffic from people that will never buy the property because they're not happy with the floor plans, for instance. And if the floor plans are front and center, they will actually be able to examine them without having to go and see the property um, physically in, in real life. NAR is uh, clearly telling us that about 30% of the properties that are for sale by owner are sold to the people that the owners knew from the past life or know currently. So they sold, so to speak, within the family. And of course, your family members would be the first people to know that your house is up for sale. Then there are people that you know from work, there are friends that you have, there are people from church that you know, and in general, depending on the size of the social network that you're within, you might very well be on your way to selling the property to somebody you know. The chances are pretty good, and this would be a fantastic outcome. The flip side of the story is that based on the stats from NIR as well, it seems that um, for sale by owners are usually underselling their property by as much as 10 to 18%, irrespective of who the property gets sold to. But that's an entirely different story. Um, I don't want to get in there. We'll stick to the things that you can actually control. So what you can control is before you start promoting the property on MLS or any other platforms where you have to pay the money, compose a little email, with the pictures and everything else, shoot it out to your circle of, of friends and family, see how they react, make a few phone calls, see if you can engage the people. And only if you're getting a definitive no, or everybody's sitting on the fence and not giving you a firm commitment that was submitting offers, this is now the time to start promoting the property elsewhere outside of the people that you know. Now it's time to start considering platforms where you can actually expose your property now that everything is ready the description the photos and, and all that and you've exhausted the list of people that you know and you want to go to the outside world and see if anybody else will be interested in your home um, in in most cases for sale by owners have a tendency to go to free platforms um, like local craigslist kijiji 
Facebook marketplace and such and uh, put up the description and the photos of the property there. And uh, this is an absolutely val valid approach. There's nothing wrong with that, but it provides you just with a fraction of an exposure that you would otherwise get on MLS. So MLS should be a primary consideration. And in order to list your property on MLS or post your property on MLS, you have to engage a brokerage. Since you're selling on your own, you are not entirely bought into the idea of using a full service brokerage. So which leaves you with an option of using what's called a fixed fee brokerage, and they offer different packages. There is quite a few names in the Canadian and the US market for brokerages that would do that. So you basically pay them a, a flat fee of sorts, say it's a $500 fee, and they in return agree to list your property on MLS and connect anybody who's interested in that property to you directly via email or a phone call. Also, some brokerages offer different packages. They can do the photos and uh, the video and the uh, 3D tour for you. Some brokerages can also offer you a package where they negotiate any offers that are coming in for you. You have to do your own research, but I would strongly suggest that you list your property on MLS. Um, you pick out the brokerage that you're most happy with. And if it's the matter of, of the money that they charge, absolutely. If it's the matter of the fullness of the package that they offer, you know, go with somebody that offers you the best possible package you can get for the money, try them out, the property is going to be on MLS. And that's when all those considerations that I talked about in the beginning of the video come into play days on market, all of a sudden your property is tracked by the MLS board. Even if it goes off the market as a suspension or a cancellation, you will still see it in history as a real estate agent. If you have access in, in your locale to the um, um, sold property data. You will also see this as a property being sold a few years back or a few months back or um, has come off the market. You will see the price history, etc. So you have to be very mindful about the price. And this is one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons why, why days on market and the fact that the property history is kept on MLS for a period of years. Now that you've exposed the property, the next thing that's going to happen is that people are going to start calling you. Leads are going to start coming in. And of course, a lot of those leads are going to be completely unqualified. You're going to get a ton of calls from real estate agents looking to get your listing. And in two to three days, you'll simply get tired of picking up the phones and having the exact same conversation because three quarters of the people calling you are going to be real estate agents looking to get your listing. I would suggest that you maintain a calm and courteous attitude regardless of who's calling you. Um, it's, it's like prospecting for gold on a riverbank and um, you have a, you scooped up too much sand in your strainer. You're thinking about throwing the whole thing away, regardless of the fact that there could be some gold in there as well. So talk to people, ask them a few strategic questions, find out if they're an agent, if they have a client, if they're looking for a listing and be very calm and nonchalant about it. Just get the information, make sure that it's in line with your expectations of who you want to see in the house and who you want to schedule showings with and then proceed from there. If you have a buyer on the phone that's not represented by an agent, ask them about their buying time frame, about whether they've been pre-qualified for a mortgage, about the budget that they have in mind, about the neighborhoods where they're looking for a house, what's important to them within the property, how many bedrooms, how many washrooms, whether they need to have a garage, etc. and compare it to the amenities that your property can offer and see if there is a match so that you're in the driver's seat and you can make a decision of whether or not to invite them through the house for a showing. The next step in this process is, of course, negotiation. So at some point, a buyer that is not represented or a buyer that has an agent representing him or her is going to bring in an offer that you're going to have to go through, understand and respond in some fashion. There are generally three ways you can respond to an offer. You can just let it be. Do nothing. Nothing will happen. The offer will die. You can accept the offer based on what you see in their price and the terms and you're happy with everything. So you can just take the offer, put the signature on the dotted line and say, yep, the house is sold, albeit conditional, say, if there are contingencies on the offer. Or you can actually counter with a different offer, changing the price or some of the terms. You have to understand the basic main terms on the offer. And it's, of course, the price, probably something you're going to be looking for or looking at primarily. There's going to be a closing date, which is very important for some sellers and very important for some buyers. So make sure that this is not a deal breaker and you actually don't glance over it and forget it. This is one of the key parameters on any offer. There's a deposit amount. So you have to understand when the deposit is coming in because the offer is not consummated until, until and unless the deposit is in the trust account of the brokerage or with your lawyer. 
So that's when the deal can consider to be consummated and can move forward. If there is no contingencies, it's considered to be firm. And if there are contingencies or conditions on the offer, until that, those conditions expire or actually fulfilled, the offer is conditional. And then it either falls through or it actually firms up and it becomes a firm offer awaiting the closing date. So um, on top of that, a very important variable is irrevocability of the offer. That's basically the expiry date of the offer that the buyer had made to you. So at first, the buyer sets the irrevocability by saying it's the offer from the buyer to the seller and it's irrevocable until 11.59 p.m. tomorrow night. You have to be mindful of that. When you signing back the offer to the buyer, and for instance, this is something that you're inclined to do and you want to change the price and you want to change the closing, so you made those changes, you're signing the offer back, Again, you have to specify revocability. You can leave the revocability the same if it gives the buyer enough time to act on it, or you can specify a, a revocability on a different day, a day away, two days away, a few hours away. The options are almost infinite. However, you have to keep in mind that once you sign the offer back to the buyer, it can become binding if they accept it. And if you do receive another offer in the interim, then you can't really entertain that offer until you do away with the first offer that's on the sign back with the buyer that can accept it and you're legally obligated to proceed with that sale. So that's another variable for you to keep in mind. And that usually dictates the amount of hours and amount of days that you're going to give to the buyer on the sign back. Similarly, when the buyer is submitting an offer to you, they're thinking about other offers potentially coming in and them having to compete. So once they submit an offer and they're within this irrevocability period, should you accept they are all of a sudden in a binding relationship. It's a transaction that is in progress and they have to act on that. So they can be submitting offers to multiple properties until they definitively know that it's a no-go with you. So that's where the um, irrevocability in the offer comes into play. So um, make sure that you consider that along other most important simple variables on the offer. And then of course there are conditions. Most Often encountered conditions are a condition on financing and a condition on an inspection. We're going to talk a little bit more about the inspection in uh, one of the bonus points in uh, literally a minute or two. And that's something for you to, to remember and make sure that you act on as well. Now that you've successfully negotiated an offer or you're very close to actually finalizing the negotiation process, it's time for you to seriously consider hiring a lawyer. In fact, I would suggest that you do this a bit before this so that you have somebody to vet the offer that you're possibly signing back to the buyer or even the offer that you will be receiving from a buyer by a real estate lawyer that can review this and they can suggest if there is anything that um, is a red flag for them, um, anything for you to pay attention to and, or anything that you may have missed or anything that may cause a problem for you down the road. So it's important for you to have a second pair of professional eyes on the offer that you're entertaining, taking or entertaining working with. And therefore, a real estate lawyer is a must at this point. This is not something that's expensive. This is something that you absolutely have to allocate the budget for. And, you know, if I were to say that, um, or rather, if I were asked what is the most important thing that I have to spend the money on as a for sale by owner, I would say that definitely it's absolutely imperative that you spend the money on hiring a professional real estate lawyer to help you with the transaction. Now, I want to give you two bonus points as discussed earlier in the video. So the uh, very first one is I do suggest that you do as a seller, as a for sale by owner, a pre-inspection of the house, meaning that you inspect the property, you pay the money and not the buyer, you have the inspection buyer in your hands, and then you share that with anybody who's qualified in your eyes to make an offer on the property or anybody who's already made an offer on the property so it can actually either cross out the inspection condition because you've already done an inspection with a reputable company or you mitigate the risk of them coming back to you after the inspection is done and they do the inspection on their own and renegotiate the price of the property. So by doing the inspection yourself, you're basically achieving two things. First of all, you know any of the things and all the things that are wrong with the property that you can fix before exposing it up for sale. And you can say, well, you know what? Here's the inspection. Here's 100% of the things that they found. I fixed 90% of them. And this is the itemized list of what I fixed and how much money I spent on them. Okay, so um, that means that you're ahead of the curb and you're not playing defensively when you're talking to a buyer. So that's one thing. Second, as I mentioned in passing, the buyer will have no option 
of saying, hey, you know what? I didn't know A, B, C, D, E. And therefore, now after I've done my own inspection from the buyer's end, I'll be coming back to you and saying, I want you to shave off $50,000 off of the price of the house because the inspection is not satisfactory to me. This way, they have the pre-inspection even before submitting an offer or right after they submit an offer. It could be, say, you, you releasing the um, inspection report on the property it could be conditional upon you receiving a valid and binding offer from buyer. And then you can share the inspection report with them. This way, everything is above board. And most importantly, from your standpoint as well, you have the opportunity to fix things that you see and or you can control the narrative for the things that you cannot fix or do not want to fix. And you can be prepared for when you're talking to the buyers and you can be in front about those things as well. And again, it's just the better way to negotiate when everything is above board and everybody knows what they're looking at. And the last bonus point has to do with open houses. Uh, a lot of times for sell by owners feel that they are obligated to go through with this burden and, and run open houses once they decide to sell their home. But the reality is that no, you don't have to. And let's go back for a second to the statistics from the National Association of Realtors. Only 5% of properties that are exposed in the marketplace sell through direct open house exposure. So it's five homes out of 100 that sell through open houses and everything else in the marketplace sells through other means. It's not a huge percentage. And let's just talk about the prep and the potential troubles that they have to go through in order, in order for you to have open houses. For one, you have to somehow promote it. You have to install a few signs in the neighborhood, specify the location of the open house, the address of the property, the date and the time for it as well. In addition to that, um, you have to be by the door greeting people along or rather with the sign-in sheet in hand. So you have to be asking everybody coming in and remember you don't know those people at all to provide some of the personal information on that sign-in sheet before they can be let into the house and, and um, allowed to see the rooms and allowed to see the floors. Not everybody's gonna be willing or interested in giving you their name, their address, their email and their cell phone number. And in some cases, you may want to ask for an ID. They will say, hey, you know what? I'm just trying to go through the open house. I don't have that information on me. I'm just not interested in giving it to you. Bottom line, as the owner, you set the rules. And if you're not comfortable, and you should not be comfortable letting uh, people that, are, that you don't know through your property without them sharing any information with you, you have to turn them away and you have to be prepared to have that conversation with them as well. So no information, no open house that sort of thing. Next thing is that if you have three floors in the house, you have to somehow replicate yourself to be in three locations at once. So if there's a family of three separates out and each one goes to a separate floor, you have to somehow have eyes on them regardless of where they are. So it'd be great to have some help there. Two more people in addition to you. So there are three floors three people minding the house and watching what's going on with the buyers that are going through the property as well. So, um, you know, those are the main points. Um, the only other one that I would mention is that um, if you have guns in the house or you have medicine in the house, um, prescription medicine, make sure that it's under lock and key, not accessible. And um, the same is true for cash and jewelry or any small items that you feel might be of value, even of sentiment sentimental value to you so that you don't, they don't walk away with the potential buyer. And sometimes that happens. So that's about it for um, open houses. That's about it for the other bonus point of the pre-inspection. And I hope this comprehensive list of things that you should expect in your journey in the sale of the house by owner gave you an idea of what to expect from this whole process. Hopefully you've internalized some of the things and you will actually be using some of the advice that I'm giving you. In case you get lost at some point, you're not sure how to position the house, and you're not sure how to price the house property or what to do with some aspects or the entirety of the negotiation once the offer comes in, make sure that the, you book a call with us. The calendar link is in the description below. We'll be happy to spend some time with you and actually share the information that we know so that you can succeed in the sale of the property that you're trying to put on the market and sell by yourself. So that's about it. If you like the content, um, give it a thumbs up consider subscribing so that you can have access to the content as it gets released every single week. So that's our schedule. We release a new content every single week and it's gonna be the same awesome content as what you got with the simple steps of selling a house by owner. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in a few days.